Chapter 7, The 100 Mile an Hour Dog. By the time we reached the house, Streaker was crouching down on the front door stop step. Charlie's Alsatians were inching towards her, cheerfully showing great ranks of glittering teeth. As far as I could see, there was no escape. At that moment, a ginger cat sauntered round the side of her house. Now you know as well as I do that dogs chase cats, but this cat was different. It was a monster. It hardly even looked like a cat. It was more like a ginger panther. As soon as it saw the three Alsatians, all its fur stood up on end so that it looked like an inflatable ginger panther. Its claws struck out. It began to screech like some nightmare creature from a horror film and held itself at Charlie's dogs. In two seconds flat, the dogs had vanished, towers between their legs. Tina and I grinned at each other. Even Streaker looked pleased until the nightmare turned on her. Before we could do a thing, the cat had flung itself at Streaker. For a brief moment, it looked as if she was going to get shredded by the moggy from hell. But Streaker had quite a different idea up her sleeve. Not that dogs have sleeve, but I'm sure you know what I mean. If Streaker had got a sleeve, then that's where she would have kept her idea. Streaker turned and, this is quite astonishing really, made a single flying leap from the doorstep and straight through an open window. The cat plunged after her and in no time at all a fight had broken out inside. I started praying silently. Please don't let anything happen to Dad's phone. Tina peered desperately through the window while I banged on the front door. What's happening? I shouted, still thumping away with my fists and getting no answer. I don't know. I saw something large fly through the air. It may have been the cat, but I think it was your dad's mobile phone being a bit too mobile. That was it. I had to do something. Pushing Tina away, I saw Streaker and the cat go skidding out of the room. I started clambering through the window. I've got to get her. Supposing somebody comes, Tina asked anxiously. They're all out. I've got to get Dad's phone back before it's completely smashed. Tina only hesitated a fraction longer. I'm coming too, she said, and hopped in behind me. There was quite a few tufts of fur lying around the carpet, some black and some ginger. I found a bit of plastic and my heart dive bombed into my boots and hid there, squealing with terror. There's another bit over here, Tina called out helpfully, pick up a large but useless lump of X mobile phone. At least it wasn't the cat, she added. To find Streaker, all we had to do was follow the noise. The two animals seemed to have started round three upstairs. It was a bit spooky creeping around somebody else's house, but I hardly had time to think about it. This was an emergency. If Dad's phone was beyond repair, then I was going to end up a hospital case. Tina and I had just reached the top landing when a door opened as if by magic, and this woman appeared, wrapped in a towel, her hair, face smeared all over with thick white paste, and her head smothered in curlers. She looked so weird that I stood there and screamed. So did she, and she could scream much louder than me. Even Streak and the cat stopped to see what all the fuss was about. The woman grabbed the first thing that came to hand, which happened to be a rather large and rather menacing laundry basket. And came straight at us, yelling like a red Indian on a scalping mission. I was terrified, and so was Tina. She yanked open the nearest door, dashed inside, pulled me into the room with her and slammed it shut behind us. It took me one second to realise that Tina had made a big mistake. We weren't in a room at all. We were locked in a broom cupboard. It was dark. The handle was on the outside of the door and there was no way out. I sank to the floor and buried my head in my hands. Well done, Tina, I murmured. Nice one. It seemed like ages before we were released. I heard voices outside and the door was opened. 
I stumbled out, eyes blinking against the bright daylight, and walked straight into the outstretched arms of a policeman. Well, 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 smirked Sergeant Smug. I used to think a policeman only said well, well, well in bad films. Maybe this was a bad film. It certainly felt like it to me. We've caught two petty criminals red-handed, breaking and entering private property with intent to steal. That's a jail sentence for five years or so. Listen, I began. It's all a mistake. My dog came. Your dog? Sergeant Smug roared with laughter and turned to the lady. This is what he said last time. He always blames it on his dog. There wasn't any dog, said the woman. Just these two on my landing. But there was, Tina insisted, and she tried to explain. The sergeant would have, wouldn't have any of it, and we were carted off to the police station, where they made a great show of taking our fingerprints and all our details before they would telephone home. Dad came to fetch us. He wasn't very pleased. In fact, he was managing a pretty good imitation of an erupting volcano on two legs. This was because Streaker had finally returned home with half a mobile phone still strapped to her collar. The woman decided not to press charges against us after all, probably because she could see that having to go home with Dad was going to be a far worse sentence than going to jail. I would have been a lot safer in jail, I reckon. The only good thing was that when Dad discovered the smugs Alsatians had been involved, he had a real go at the sergeant. Dad didn't like the smugs dogs any more than I did. So there you are. I had now ended up at the police station twice in one week. I still had to walk streaker and I now owed Dad billions of pounds for his broken mobile. Isn't life wonderful?